I slowly open my eyes, a bright white light assaults my retinas. For a moment, I just lay where I am, mildly staring ahead while we scattered thoughts coalesced in my slowly waking mind. Slowly but surely, the white begins to come into focus as the bare expanse begins to be drawn across my field of vision. It's only when the light fixture comes into view that my mind clicks at it. This is the ceiling above me. Slowly levering myself up, I silently absorb through all my senses the details of the room I'm in. The smell and taste of a strong bleach hangs in the air, lending the impression of a place just slightly too clean but to be natural. The fence of pale peach colored walls, all perfectly painted without a crack, stain, or imperfection. A single frame painting hangs on the wall, perfectly straight, ha straightened like the walls, and it's boring and inoffensive that it can be. My attention is grabbed by the trellisant curtain waving across my vision, my eyes following it to the open window it covers. I move my right arm to try and lift myself up. I look through it and feel the cat throwing at the cater dig uncontrollably, uncomfortably. If only now, too, that I notice the canula tubes winding around my cheek and into my nose. As there's some vision, I settle for just looking around the corner of the window. Beyond the thick leaves of several large trees, I can see the green river below backing out onto the field, a customary island of green on the outskirts of the city. Judging by the sun outside, it's noon. Of which day, though, I'm not sure. So, I'm in the hospital once again. I let out a long, tired breath as I try to collect my scattered thoughts. My mind seemed to cast in a dozen directions all at once as my emotion running through me. After slowly lying back down, I decide to start at the very beginning while I'm here. I cast my mind back, but I can't work out a smooth recollection of what's happened. The events of last night, or whichever night it was, came back more of a series of snapshots than any co cohesive memory. Lying on my bed, looking at the origami bird, t talking to Hideki outside the Hakamichi residence, running down the street, passing pedestrians, and bumping into one more and more, uh, falling, looking up at the searingly bright airport entrance, seeing Lily's black Lily's back. As I lay on the ground, the silence of the private room suddenly feels overwhelming. So that's it. I had my chance to correct my mistake, and I blew it. While there was at fault for neglecting my medications and disregarding the pace myself, when my body was giving out too so soon, it doesn't matter now. <laughs> All that matters is that, once again, I'm alone. The pastel blue pillow yields. With little resistance, I let myself fall back on the bed. The starchy case, along, along with the starchy sheets, providing little comfort. Compared to the darkness of last night's events, the bright light of the room around me is striking. All it does, though, is emphasize how over otherworldly places like this we are. Arrhythmia. A strange word, a foreign alien one, one that you don't want to be in the same room with. A rare condition that causes the heart to act radically and occasionally beat way too fast. It can be fatal. It was a miracle that you were able to go on so long without anything happening, they said. And then it did. My condition has taken away everything. My old school was of no importance anymore. My home was reduced to a faraway place, while my friends in first love simply stopped visiting after a length of time. I became a cynical and breaded, bitter, distant and subdued in my defense. No person can avoid that after such a thing happening to them. But nonetheless, I left the hospital as a very different, definitively changed person. Things changed. I made my new friends in Monaco. I made new friends in Anapa, Jadun, and Misha. I found a new sense of home, in my dormitories. 
a new interest in science that will willed out around me. And I found direction that, to my life that I had never felt before. But I had also discovered other things. The sense of isolation in Yamaku and the surrounds that was not entirely unwelcome. The quiet giving a peace of mind I may not have been found elsewhere. But it gave that area a feeling of being pushed out of the way. Of being kept out of sight. People in the streets would sometimes glance awkwardly or quickly turn their heads as they realized they were staring. Even if my condition was invisible, my uniform was. Even if I weren't, it was still different. It took 70, 17 pills a day, morning, midday, and night. My scar, though, hidden behind clothing, was still a still permanent mark of my condition. And most of all, there was also a very possibility a very real possibility of death. A bad fall, an absent mind hard hit on the back, a simple sprint taken too far. Anything could have set my heart off, and several times I teetered on the edge of the abyss, even with all the care I took of myself. But that was fine. I could have lived with all that, because there's one thing I found, or rather, we found after entering Yamaku, which was once again snatched away before my eyes. It was only now that I realized just how delicate my newfound sense of happiness was. Everything depending on her, the linchpin of my life since I had first entered Yamaku as a sullen, confused, and aimless transfer student. The least Tao was the one person I could depend on above all others, and who reciprocated the love I felt for her, but I failed her, and only realized it all too late. I thought that I could just set my life up and continue the way forever, but the real world doesn't work like that. I finally realized the meaning of those words would only be struck down as I, confer as I confronted my failure to do so in time. In the surrounding I'm in now, not too familiar. It's as if Yamaku was but a dream, and I'm still recurring my first major heart attack. Maybe that's why I feel so tired. It feels almost as if I've lived the entire last few months of my life in the space of minutes. The weight of my eyelids closed my eyes. My physical and mes mental exhaustion letting me offer no resistance. An intelligible mumbling from my head of the bed stirs me out of my sleep. My eyes still closed. I can focus and make out someone, presumably a nurse, bidding farewell to a doctor. As I open my eyes, I notice a door closing in my peripheral vision. The doctor's reading some notes off a clipboard, holding his hand carefully looking over the pages. After consulting his obviously very important documents, he looks up and notices my gaze. It's now that I notice something slightly odd about his expression and general disposition, but I can't quite put my finger on it. I right, see so you're awake, Mr. Nakai. I quick lad to my bed and, and to verify my name. Show that his documents obviously didn't have his written on them. I must admit that this is a bit unfortunate. Your parents visited just earlier while you were asleep. I can notify them if you're waked out if you'd like. Come. Thanks. That would be good. I give a somewhat dazed reply, most likely to be the one that he expected before he really thinking about what I'm saying. Not a problem. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, I'll be able to, I'll be happy to answer them. That is, unless you prefer to rest. The anesthetic's still going to be affecting you a bit, I'm afraid. Anesthetics, of course. That's why I feel so strange the first time I woke up. I slowly shake my head, not wanting to dislodge any pipes that have 
it would cause myself any more discomfort than necessary. The doctor politely puts down his clipboard in response. I guess my main question is, what hap exactly happened? Put it simply, you've uncom unfortunately had another heart attack. While not as severe as your first, you were very lucky to occur so close to the hospital. After being stabilized, you were taken to the operating room. What followed was a keyhole surgery in order to insert a tempered, temporary pacemaker. All in all, the incident happened two days ago, with an emergency treatment being carried out very soon afterward. Since then, we've kept you over, under close observation while you were asleep. Will I be alright? Are there any lasting problems? Remember the procedure carried out the first, uh, uh, for your first heart attack. This is relatively minor. Well, you have no one to go surgery once more in a few days. Time to remove the pacemaker. Assuming there are no complications, there should be no lasting implication. Continues talking to the subject, shifting the repetition of facts and about rhythmia. My medication that I already know, for the most part. I start to nod in vain interest while my mind rifts. I begin to think of how peacefully hung an inoffensive painting and on the wall behind his shoulder is. How neat and sterile the surroundings are even including the doctor himself. If my mind mum if my mumbling bores you, you're quite welcome to say no. Or say so, Mr. Nikai. Lord knows I lose track of myself sometimes. He gives a short chuckle at his self deprecating joke, as I grimace after with awkwardly having been rather badly caught out. The doctor chuckles sound different from the nurse at Yamaku though. I come to think of it, as I ponder why I realize why the man in front of me feels just a little bit off. His smile is neat and sterile. He delivers the little joke perfectly, the customary inoffensive chuckle. It's like, rather than talking to the man whose name is neatly printed on the name tag, pinned into his lap coat, I'm merely interacting with an actor reading off a pre-rehearsed pre -rehearsed script every action had been chore choreographed beforehand. I suppose that he has to be this way though, being a doctor. He has to keep a neat and sterile smile when chatting to the girls with cancer, slowly spreading through her body, one reassuring the woman who will surely die from childbirth, and with every other terminally critical ill patient. That little of distance, that little of aloofness, it makes me wonder if I'm been too harsh, especially considering it's a disposition far from being adopted only by enough by his profession. After all, the one I love kept the same distance from the others herself. Looking up to the doctors again, I realize I've been caught in my head but bowed for some time. I understand you must still be tired. You've been through a lot, as I mentioned before. Anesthetics would still affect me, me affecting you. If you don't mind, I'll let you get some rest until your parents and tell your parents you've woken up for you. I think that'll be good. Thank you. He usually could not before make, picking up a clipboard and making his way to the large white door in the corner of the room, closing it behind me with a thud. In the end, I'm alone again. Lily's gone, the cure is gone, Malcolm would be traveling, and even my parents have already left the hospital. Four pale peach walls, one white ceiling, and a single open window to look out towards the world outside. It's hard to think of my future when the past is crowded around with around you. Claustrophobia in its neat, sterile, starchy, bleat smelling rip for what to do or focus on. I content myself with sleeping the same time away as if this were all just another dream in Yamaku I've been. White. A sterile clean white for a sterile clean room. My eyes open, I simply stare in the ceiling for some time. It's about as interesting as a television would be. 
mounted in this met metal rack hanging off the ceiling out of a the bed. Indeed, the television saw its entire use during the time parents were here, left on quietly as they wa waited for me to wake. It was about as banal as it had been the first time it ended up in the hospital. Earlier today, an attendant nurse had offered her uh, uh, turn off the EKG's uh, speakers. I refused to believe because the sound is so entirely normal to me now. It's almost comforting in a way. The metronome-like regulatory gives at least some feeling. And the time is moving, even a place such as this. After some time of listening to its ble beeping, while I fully awaken, though, I realize there's another sound in the room. Concentrating all my efforts on listening, a task made rather easy by the lack of distraction, a tiny, tinny melody can be held, heard. Light and quiet. The music sounds almost fragile, as if dwarfed by the EKG's pulses. Tilting my head just slightly to the side, in an effort to see the source of the melody, without dislodging any of the sensors, my pipe stuck onto me. I notice a wooden box sitting on the nightstand next to my bed. My mouth opens slightly, while I watch silently to watch the tiny yellow metal drum slowly rotate inside, the little bumps on the surface gradually moving in and out of sight. This music box, it's the one I gave. The creaking of the door breaks me onto my rear ear, my head and heart remaining still as my eyes turn to see who comes through. Long tan skirt, peach off the shoulder sweater. Pale, almost porcelain skin, blue colored eyes, and long yellow hair. All I can do is stare as Lily slowly walks into the room, her fingers lightly running over the wall of orientation. My mind comes as shrugging hope. Lily? She stops mid strike, her entire body tensing. Miss Al, was that you? Her voice is quiet and pensive, echoing her expression. I thought you were... Lily takes one tentative step forward, then another as if she were holding herself back. Her control over composure is for naught, though. She finally rushes over where I lay as the last of her resistance falls. I'm slightly taken aback. She grabs hold of me, hunching over as tears begin to fall from her cheeks. Since one minute ago, I thought she was on the other side of the world. After a moment of hesitation, I rest my hat right hand on her shoulder. It's Al! It's Al! Lee's body trembles at her a lot in the dark blue sheets. Her motions flooding through her carefully maintained exterior. With her face now closed, Closer and make easier to see her pale skin being lit by the sunlight from the window. I notice her cheeks being redder than they should be. It's okay, Lily. I'm okay. You don't need to. She writes herself quickly, her crying forcefully stifled, with both sadness and stubbornness remaining in her most moistened eyes. Her pleasure, her prideful nature, always had been something to contend with. It takes me off guard. Stop telling me not to worry about you, Sal. Just this once. Let me cry. I'm caught speechless. She waits for a response, but the composure breaks again after a handful of seconds. I swallow hard and try to saddle my own emotions while she weeps into my bed. A strange mixture of relief and depression welling up. Louise, here. She's really here. If I couldn't feel her skin under my hand, I'd hardly believe my own eyes. My efforts were for nothing, wasn't for nothing. My body's attempt to take away everything that was important to me, once again, had been foiled. But now, I don't feel as happy about it as I thought I would. Seeing her here, crying like this over me, 
This is the one thing I wanted to avoid since coming to love her. No. Even simply in the hospital. I'm sorry, Lily. It's my fault I'm here. I shouldn't have tried to push myself so far. Give it give a self to deprecating snort. After just months of keeping myself together so nobody worried about me. I went and did something like this. I guess I'm pretty dumb. With a couple of sniffs and a long breath, Lily well, manages to pull herself together and calm down a little. <sighs> Despite her red cheeks, moist, moist eyes, and the lines of her tears is still visible. She delicately wears the weak smile she seemed to so often give. And you needn't blame yourself. I heard later that it happened as you were running down the road after me, right? Still, she wipes her eyes with the back of her head, returning more to her old self, old self as the rush of emotions were off. Why did you run after me, Sal? I moved to respond, but noticed her face tightening. Even after I said goodbye, and then left you out to the academy. She takes a moment to steady herself, her emotions almost bubbling up once again. I just wanted to say I'm sorry. Sorry? The time when I was in there when you needed me. Until now, I thought you were being there would be enough. I only needed you by my side to make that day feel better. Even if my body may feel like this, I wanted to help you, Lily. To be there when you needed someone. But you're always there, Sal. Why did you want to go to Scotland, Lily? Why? I told you before, because the chariot was going because my family summons to their home. Why didn't you say that you want... Why didn't you say that you want us to go? I... I'm not stubborn often, but this one time I think I need to be... I want you to stay here, Lily. I want you to stay where everyone you know lives and where all your dreams and ambitions were made. If you choose to stay, I'll leave you, never leave your side. I won't lose another person. When I had my heart attack, I was snatched away from everyone and else everywhere. I knew. You showed me a new life after I came to Yamaku. I lost my past, but you showed me a future. It's true I haven't seen been I haven't been there for you. I'm unreliable sometimes. I'm not lied, I thought I'd come to understand you when I haven't even understood myself. Be that as it may. I want to give you the future as well. I want to back there. I want to be there for you. To share both your burdens and your happiness. Just like I had promised back in Akaido. I want you to trust me. I know I'd probably come in to put my trust in you. After losing some people I'd known after my heart attack. But that's how I know that being unable to trust others can feel awful. That's why I can't watch you just throw everything away like this. I never want you to go away. You go through whatever I did. I would do anything to stop that. You can be quite steadfast when you want to be, can't you? As I said, it isn't often. My weak smile drops, though. Drew an IV in my arms digs it a little. It's a harsh reminder of my tether to my condition. Lee's face tenses as I let out a small gasp of pain making me wish I'd stifled better. All I can do is sigh and defeat. I tried to not let anyone worry over me for the entire time since I left the hospital. But I can't even stop that one person I love more, most from crying over me. Even if I might be able to put my feelings into words, I feel pretty useless with a body like this. Every time I try to reach the towards or something, it was just snatched away, and even now, only turned out to be better due to luck. I guess there's something else I should apologize for. All I can ever do is make you worry. Even now, there's very little chance I'll live anywhere near a full life. My feelings of Lily's warm, soft hand moving over my left cheek, making me lift my head up, her smile gentle and warm as she touches me. I think that is something very natural for you to say. You're always so sincere and self-conscious. 
could also reserve the palm mattered and patient to a full fault with Anako, yet curious about everything and everyone. When I said I'd missed you a while while I was with your, my family, I wasn't lying or exaggerating. The thought of you would never, far from your mind, help me through that time. That's why I was so confused about what to do with my family summoned me. Even after I thought I may have made my decision, you tried your hardest to challenge me about it. I didn't confess to you about pity of believing you were somehow different from what you are. I confessed because I never wanted to lose you, <laughs> and wanted you to always be part of my life, no matter what might change. You're a very beautiful person, this Al. Your heart changes none of that, so please don't apologize for yourself anymore. A long time. Silent train in the room. I'm not, I'm not really sure what this newly born feeling inside of me is, but what it pales into insignificance as wordlessly gay as slowly smiling face, warm and gentle as it was always been. It's only on her thumb crosses her cheek, wiping away a single drop of moisture, that I realize this is all I ever wanted. Well, it feels like the first time I give an earnest, wide smile. As Lily feels it against her palm, she returns his gesture. More time passed before every, either of us say a word. Neither of us needing to speak to communicate our feelings to each other. I know I can't promise you that I'll always be around, but that we'll be together forever. With some difficulty, I slowly lift my hand, placing it on her pale shoulder. But, I think I can at least take care of you. Take you to next year's Tadapata Festival. To make up for you making you miss this year's. Lily's expression is one of surprise. Though I can't say I blame her. You remember that? I've got a pretty good memory, sometimes. She raises her head a little and takes her hand from her cheek. Gives a smile and amused giggle. I smile absently at how earnest it is, almost girlish in its lightness. Still smiling warmly, she clicks herself and stands up upright, with a hand resting on my chest. It feels like I'm seeing her for the first time. The sound of the window glowing behind her, just as it did when I first walked in the room where she was drinking tea. Very well then. Shall we make a promise between the both of us to go next year's Tanabata together? Even if she can't see me doing so, I nod approvingly. I promise. I promise. <sighs> Fuck. And that is the end of Lily's arc. Or er, Lily's route. These are definitely not getting easier. <laughs> Again, I'm speechless pretty much. Here Lily and I silently sit on the grassy embankment, high above the local town, a breeze gently blowing through the cloudless sky. It may just be a few minutes walk from town, on a hill just outside its limits, but the view is entirely unexpected. Lily sits beside her, her eyes closed as a gentle breeze flows through their hair. This is a nice area. Yeah, I never knew a place like this was anywhere near Yamaku. 
and I have to be the one to find it, of course. Akira's grin is genuine, but her tone is slightly different from her usual carefree nature. It's good that you were out of the hospital, though, as hell. Nobody's more glad than I am. I can't stand hospitals. So, you two are going back to school tomorrow? Yep, yep. Akira chuckles in my amusement poorly looking back to uh, the town below. The trees between the buildings swaying in the wind. Pity we couldn't go up north for the summer holiday or get to Tanabata. I don't, I wouldn't worry. There's always next time. You'll be graduating before next summer vacation, won't ya? Yeah, there'll still be college after that, mind. From the same one? Likely, we both have high enough scores to meet the industry requirements. You sound so sure. Don't worry. You, you're better than I in most subjects. I guess we'll work it out to a new time. That's the way. Just enjoy yourself and your mouth while you're there. Lily gives a sad sigh for the distinction made between a cure and both the two of us. Do you really need to go back to Scotland? Yeah. Folk, the folks are already out in my blood as it is. You weren't meant to stay this long. She gives her trademark wide grin. Say my boyfriend up with my passport that took some time. Or with a passport that took some time. You're taking him with you? Just for a while, at first. He's a pleasant and worldly guy, so I thought he'd do just fine. That Kira gives an amused snort. Her father had it his way. Had gone long ago, long ago. I just couldn't pass an excuse to, to stay with my favorite little sister a little while longer, though. She leans right and gives Lily a tightly painful hug, cheering her up considerably. It's nice to be with you one last time, though. For what it's worth, I'm on the same boat. Yeah, thank you, too. I'll try and come back sometime, don't worry. It's a shame that the business keeps being keeps you so busy. The place won't run itself, I'm afraid, and I think it's gonna just um be the same over there. Considering that, I better get going. Have fun there over there, Akira. Haha, <laughs> we'll do. With a slight grunt, she lifts herself up with her hands and stands up. Listing herself off as she does so. Well, I better be off. The plane won't wait for me after all. She has a certain unusual wistfulness in the tone of her voice. Her eyes firmly implanted on her sister. I'll be over. I'll be okay, Kira. Yeah, I know. Come now. If it isn't that bad. You'll be able to see us again soon. It's strange to see Lily reassuring and doubting Akira for once. She really has changed. Goodbye, Akira. Bye. For a second, the dark clad figure looks down at both of us, smiling widely. Perhaps more widely than ever seen her do before. She lets out a long, slightly wearing breath to steady herself before leaving. Eventually slips her hand into her pocket and turns on her heel. And with that, she walks away. One hand held high, and there she goes. See you later, you two. A jazz tune with no beat, melody of direction to the very end. After a few moments of silent, uh, sitting silently, Lily and I pick ourselves up and dust ourselves off. Turning towards her with a broad smile, I hold out my hand. Shall we be off then? She takes me my hand in hers. With a gentle nod and a smile and beautiful and warm as ever. And did we we shall us out? As we set off towards the school, that wonderful smile engraves itself on my memory. That wonderful smile that we both share. Her past may be scattered, and at times overshadowed by sa sadness. They're also irrevocable, part of our lives and personalities. Even though I could change a single thing, I wouldn't. 
because my past was what led me here. That's why, even with all that sadness before, and all that may well befall us together, we'll keep walking forwards. Forwards toward the future. Our future. And that is that now that is the end of Lily's route. That was just a little epilogue. Wow. I, I don't even know, honestly. I never know how to end these off. But I guess I'll end off saying I'll see you next time on Katawa Shoujo. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you.